What's up guys, welcome to Daily Dose of Reddit. This is your host, Zach, and today's subreddit is r slash petty revenge. All right, this story's called, Kids repeatedly try to cause car accidents and tell me they're going to tell the police it's my fault. On mobile, oblig ob obligated apology. Let me start by saying the kids had to be in their late teens or early 20s. Two of them had tattoos, not children, but young adults that still act like kids. I, 32 female, work at a barricade company. Easiest way to describe it, I'm the one that closes down the traffic lanes and makes you late to stuff. This happened two days ago, and I hope my revenge was petty enough, but here you are. I had a lane closure that I needed to take off the road. I'm about halfway down when I get a city bus stop with two guys and a girl. They asked me if I could give them a ride so they don't have to take the bus. I said, sorry guys, I can't, I'm working. And continue to take the lane closure. The girl stood up and said, I freaking hate rude ugly cooters. I reply, congratulations, and keep doing my job. They keep yelling insults. I ignore them. When I was about 300 feet away, the yelling stops, and I see the guys had gotten up and started throwing the barricades in the street into the lane that is now open for traffic to drive in. I run over and take them out of the road and explain to them that if they did that again, I I would call the cops. Then the girl chimed in. Go ahead, bimbo. It's not our fault. You're so stupid. You're forgetting to take them all down. I walk away. They do it again. I called the cops. They said that they would be there ASAP. In my experience, that means about an hour. So I walk over and tell them I called the cops and stand there so they can't move them again. After about five minutes of standing there, the boys told the girl that they were going to get a drink from the Circle K the bus stop was in front of. They left and she would not look at anything but her phone. Now I'm annoyed. I still have more work to do and this lane closure is still up and it's approaching rush hour. And I decided, screw these kids. I pulled out my pepper spray and I sprayed the handles of the barricades that they kept throwing in the street and walked about 50 feet away and waiting. The boys came out of the store, put their bags down and grabbed a barricade in each and threw them in the street. But the handles were wet so they they only went on the shoulder, so I didn't go to move them immediately. I saw they wiped their hands off on their pants, but because of the bus stop, I couldn't see everything. But about a minute later, one of the boys got up and ran into the Circle K with his hand over his eye. The other boy ran in there a second later too, though nothing seemed to be bothering him. About 10 minutes later, when they came out of the store, the cops were just showing up, and they both took off sprinting down the street and totally bailed on the girl. I talked to the cops and told them the boys ran off and the girl never touched a barricade so they were good to go the girl was crying because her boyfriend left her there <laughs> that's amazing that's really good revenge um pepper spray is painful i'm assuming all right this story's called you want to deprive our whole cul-de-sac of sleep for years with loud music in the middle of the night let us be your alarm clock in the morning i'm bad at titles excuse me since we were but small babes, our neighbors, their kids, and their friends have had this lovely habit of either driving into or straight tearing into the neighborhood with no regard for the safety and well-being of themselves or the rest of us, and blasting pop and rap music from their cars as they sit there, idling and waiting for whomever they were picking up or dropping off. No surprise, they took their sweet time and sometimes no one was picked up or maybe even dropped off. So, you can imagine the pure, overwhelming joy we experienced when we found out some of the drivers only came into the cul-de-sac to lean out the window to briefly talk to someone, all while their music practically rattled the foundation of our houses. Our dad, at the time, and still, can work late into the night and early into the morning, sometimes coming home in the middle of the night, and at other times not returning until later the next morning. So, you can imagine what what he had to deal with. Poor dad. However, then the day arrived. Our mom had to leave relatively early for something. My memory is a mashed Pop-Tart. Sorry! And dad was not home yet. Sick and tired after so many nights and mornings having been woken up or kept awake, it was quiet now and 
we were alone. It was time. Now, we were still exhausted, but we rarely had opportunities where we were alone, and less likely to get grounded by our parents, as they were not home. And so, the sun began to peek over the trees like a Midwestern version of the opening to The Lion King. We carried a radio out of the house and stood at the end of the guilty neighbor's driveway, cranking up the volume as high as it would go, put in our chosen weapon, a cassette tape, a bagpipe music, and flick the music music on and gently waking the whole house, and probably every other neighborhood for several blocks, with the song of our people. It was not our intention to involve innocent people, but we were pretty young and hadn't completely thought the whole plan through. Our lack of a complete plan was made very apparent as the front door flew open and out ran the parents. Our terror-filled little screams followed us back home as we thought we would literally die. As soon as we were able to get inside and locked the door, we turned off the music, stuffed the radio away, and promptly pretended to be sleeping. Eventually, we did fall asleep, but we were woken up by our own parents. No surprise, but the neighbors were all not too happy with us. Though, only the one family snitched. We got in so much trouble for that. Grounded for weeks. But it was worth it. While the cars kept coming into the cul-de-sac at all hours, they no longer played music. We had won. Ayo! What a satisfying victory, good revenge. It seems like a freaking TV show that you'd see like 30 years ago of like something like uh, Dennis the Menace would do if his thing was like 20 years later. All right, this story's called No More Gaming For You, Buddy. So I, 15 male, have an older brother, 18, and he's a massive jerk. I'd rather not get into it on this post, but basically he thinks I should respect all the time and treat him like a god. He actually actually said to my dad once that he should be able to hit me whenever he wants and I shouldn't be able to do anything about it. So thankfully now he doesn't hit me, but we have conflicts every now and then. The Revenge. So we have a PS4 I mostly play on, but he plays on it sometimes too. I downloaded this app for PC called NetCut, which lets you control the internet from devices connected to it. So I enacted my plan. So every single time he tried to play, he plays Modern Warfare, I'd let him play a bit, then turn his internet off on the PS4. Oh, you're in an intense fight? Whoops, the internet went off. Oh, you're almost about to win? Whoops, your internet's gone. Sometimes I'd even say to him while he's lagging, is the internet working? It made me smile each time he raged. And I got some justice for all the times he's been a butthole. Also, I wrote this on mobile, so please forgive my crappy format. Edit. I'd like to add some crap. What I would first do is lower the internet speed for the PS4, so at the start of the game, he would lag a lot. Not enough to make him disconnect, but enough to make him leave the party and not be able to talk to his friends. After that, I waited. I just watched his gameplay. He would sometimes rage, which would make me smile more. I would just sit there whenever it was time for him to play. I would always make sure to act like the internet was really slow. And one time, I even asked him, do you disconnect out of games when you're playing on the PS4? Then, when I think it's the right time, I strike. Also, I wait on purpose. Instead of making him disconnect early, it's because I want him to waste his time. He'll suffer more if he disconnects in a fight or the final circle or something. Also, if r slash or dark fluff reads this, I'm gonna be ecstatic. Well, no r slash here, but we're daily dose of Reddit. That's pretty cool, right? I think it is. I mean, if you don't, it's cool. <laughs> but that's actually brutal revenge. Uh, petty? No. Nuclear? No. Black hole? Yeah. No. It's freaking Moar, mother of all revenges. That's actually sadistic, bro. You gotta cut it out. This story's called Everyone's Got Selective Hearing in the Pharmacy. I work in the market version of the big box store with the spark in the pharmacy. What? Literally just had this conversation with a patient who has now called twice within 10 to 15 minutes. First call, the patient is asking about if we have filled his oxycodone. It's not filled as it's out of stock and we don't receive C2 orders except two days of the week. 
week, days. His script came over the weekend. I inform him we won't have it until tomorrow. He then gets upset and starts asking when the order will be in, time specific. When the doc sent it, and that tomorrow probably won't work for him. Told him if he wants to call his doctor and they can send it to another pharmacy and cancel it with us. Tells me he'll think about it and may call back. Now the second call. Hi, I called about 10 minutes ago about my oxycodone not being filled, and I would like to have it transferred to another pharmacy. Okay, so you would have to call your doctor and have them electronically send it to another pharmacy. They already have sent it electronically. You're holding it for me. Yes, uh, but this type of medication cannot be transferred by federal law. That's not what you told me 10 minutes ago. You said there was no problem it could be transferred. No, I did not. I told you that you would have to have the doctor call it into another pharmacy. You said it could be transferred. Uh, well, you'll need to call your doctor to send it in. No one even called me to let me know that it was on back order. It's not on back order. It'll just be in tomorrow. Hang up sound. Woo. Decided to look in our resolution queue at a script. Big smile across my face. I click the send out of stock text message to him. Edit. Let me set this straight for the people in the back. Once a schedule two controlled medicine comes in electronically, it, by federal law, cannot be transferred or printed out and taken to another pharmacy. This guy's RX was out of stock, told him it will be in tomorrow, which he just picked it up 10 minutes ago, all fine. C2 meds come in twice a week. I told him such, and if he didn't want to wait, he could call his doctor to send it elsewhere to pick up. He didn't want to take the initiative for his own health, so it's down to just wait for the med to come in. I'm not a bad person for having my hands tied. Okay, thanks, bye. I agree. That guy was just being difficult, and you did your job, and you did it satisfact- satisfactor- you know what I'm saying. Satisfactorily? Right? Is that- am I stupid? Alright, this story's called Petty Revenge While Driving. Another post made me think of this. First post on mobile. I live out in the country, so we have a lot of two-lane roads. I try to keep the speed limit, but I sometimes realize that I'm going 73 and a 65 speed limit, as an example. I'm not going to drive slower unless the weather requires it. Every once in a while, I have some jerk riding my bumper when I'm going a little over the speed limit, so I will start slowing down gradually. If they back off to a reasonable distance, I will set my cruise control at the exact speed limit. If they don't back off, I continue slowing down until we get to a passing lane where I let them pass me so I can drive in peace. Most of the time, they back off, only to do it again about a mile or two down the road. The majority figure it out by the second time and just wait until the next chance to pass me. I live in an area where pulling over is difficult to impossible in many areas. There is no shoulder, steep embankments, low water crossing, guardrails, and one road has cattle guards. The county has put in passing lines where possible, but it's possible to travel 20 to 30 miles without having two lanes each way. Basically, if that was an option, I would take it. Unfortunately, most buttholes pull this crap where there are miles between passing zones. Sucks, but it is what it is. And it too! This is not a regular occurrence. It happens infrequently around here. Most people who drive out here know what they need to keep a distance due to deer and other assorted animals that might make a quick stop necessary. I slow down until they back off, because if I see deer, by the way, they are spotted daily, or a buzzard after roadkill, I had one bust the grill of my vehicle recently while trying to make it across the road ahead of me. Sudden stops are common, and only an idiot rides a bumper out here. Yeah, tailgating is so stupid. Stupid! Like, what's the point? It's not gonna make anything go any faster. It's just adding stress where it doesn't need to be. This story's called A Satisfying Way to Get Revenge on an Old White Man Telling Me I'm Anti-Feminist. I don't want to get into a whole debate about my politics, but I'll just say I'm a member of a political party in the UK that allows their members to submit policy ideas. I also own my own business selling scrunchies. It's important, I promise. Is it, or is it just a way for you to flex your, your scrunchy business? A bit of backstory. I, 20 female, suffered really bad mental health brought on by my birth control. I didn't know it was my birth control till I did some research. I found it crazy that my doctor never told me and instead put me in therapy rather than trying to change the cause of the problem. So I wrote a policy where doctors would check in on the mental health of women on birth control whenever they came 
in to get more, mainly focusing on the pill. I got a lot of support, except from this one guy, male 60. I'll call him Mark. He's super sexist, sleazy, and hates me for some reason. Likes everything to stay the same as it was when he was younger. I submitted the policy and then received an email from Mark with the entire policy committee, which I am a part of, CC'd in. He rewrote my policy, picking out every tiny mistake in red text, like some kind of teacher. He then told me I was setting feminism back to the days of Mary Stopes, a woman who worked on contraception access over 100 years ago. It was a patronizing email, clearly designed to belittle and embarrass me when all I wanted to do was to help women not go through what I did. So I responded, telling him I was so sorry for setting feminism back. And to make up for it, I had named a scrunchie after him of which I will donate the profits to the charity named after Mary Stopes herself. I'm pretty proud of it. It's doing quite well in the shop too. Apparently a lot of people hate Mark and have bought one just to get back at him. He's pretty livid. Edits, please stop trying to figure out who I am and who Mark is. Pretty scary having people messaging me telling me who I am. Thanks. <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, that's a thing. I like to guess like locations and things when they give hints and stuff, but don't guess people's identity <laughs> it's kind of weird. Unless they're like famous or something. It's like, haha, guess what celebrity I am. In which case, it's all fun because they're already famous. Anyway, OP, that was really creative um, <laughs> and really, really funny. Good revenge. Good revenge. Good idea. Also, good on you for being active politically. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode.